But hey, welcome Oslo, welcome uh, Copenhagen. Um, this is VIP VoIP. Um, today our guest is Martin Bryant, and he's editor of The Next Web, um, which is one of the world's most influential blogs, not only in technology, but in general. Um, he's got a lot of experience in people pitching his, their startup to him. Um, so hopefully he's gonna share with us some secrets um, and how best we can present our startups to the media as well. Hello from Manchester. Hi from Copenhagen and Oslo is joining us as well. Um, so maybe a good place to start is just to give a little uh, kind of 30 second or one minute snapshot of, of who you are and uh, what the next web is. Okay, yeah, sure. So I'm uh, Martin Bryant. I'm editor in chief at the Next Web, um, and uh, the Next Web. Uh, uh, I think a lot of people know it as uh, a tech blog covering startups, uh, based in Europe, based in Amsterdam. Uh, but uh, we uh, we actually started as an events company, uh, which itself started as um, a tech startup. So uh, it was a tech startup in Amsterdam thinking, how do we get people to pay attention to us? We can't afford, we don't have the budget to go to America to something like Demo or one of those kind of conferences to launch. So let's hold something in Amsterdam and get everyone to come to us. So they did that, um, launched a, a conference in Amsterdam. The, the uh, conference turned out to be more successful than the startup. Um, then they thought, let's launch a blog to promote the conference. And uh, yeah, it's kind of gone on from there, really. And uh, the, the blog has kind of taken on a life of its own. It's uh, uh, kind of uh, very well known in the States now. A lot of people think we're in the state, uh, we're actually based in the States. Um, uh, I, I had one American VC say to me uh, last year, but you use American English. Um, which is quite a good point, actually, because we have uh, a lot of European writers who we actually have to kind of uh, train to write in US English because uh, the biggest chunk of our audience is in the States. But uh, then uh, it's kind of made up of a lot of Europe kind of uh, kind of makes up a lot of the, the rest of the audience, although India has kind of come up behind as our, our third audience. Uh, but, yeah, so we, we keep an eye on uh, everything that's going on uh, across the uh, tech world. Um, uh, from kind of Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, right through to uh, the smallest startups. Uh, the biggest thrill I get is uh, covering a startup and uh, and seeing them kind of uh, go places. So uh, that's uh, all, always good to see. Um, I have I've been doing this uh, next month will be five years since I wrote my first post for the next web. Um, before that, I wasn't really involved in uh, tech at all uh, professionally. I was uh, uh, I, I I did um, broadcasting at university. I studied broadcasting um, with a view to becoming a television producer. And uh, that was okay, but um, uh, my course had been designed by people who were writing, uh, who were making television programs in the 1980s, and this was the end of the 90s, start of the 2000s, and so they were telling us how to do things that people just didn't do in professional television anymore because it, it was all 80s techniques. So uh, I kind of left university not really being, not really having the right skill set for that. So I ended up working in a school helping kids make TV and radio programs uh, and blogging on the side. It, it wasn't that interesting. Basically no, saying <laughs> I, I somehow stumbled into tech blogging. Cool. Okay, cool. So you, you originally joined as a writer and then you, you kind of progressed up the ranks uh, into editor-in-chief. Uh, yeah, so uh, kind of started as a, a volunteer when there was only one full-time staff member. So Z uh, was uh, hired as uh, the, uh, uh, the the second editor in chief that they had. Um, the first one had gone away to work for a, a Dutch newspaper. So they brought in Z, and he was hiring a couple of part-time people just to maybe write a post a day. So I, I was one of those people. My first post was about the launch of Google Wave. Um, Google's Wave drowns out Microsoft's Bing hype was the, uh, the title, which has stuck with me ever since, because uh, Bing had launched the day before. So uh, next month, the fifth anniversary of Bing and Google Wave. Um, Bing, a blatant copy uh, of uh, a Google product. Uh, Wave, an amazing, uh, bold, new technology. Bing has kind of succeeded in, in its own way. Uh, Wave, what have happened to Wave? So, uh, yeah, uh, interesting to see that. But, uh, yeah, I kind of worked my way up through, through there, including a long stint as a European editor, which was, uh, I have to say, incredibly fun, uh, traveling around Europe a lot to see startups in different areas. Cool. So, so for me, I mean, the, the blog originating out of uh, Amsterdam and the whole, the whole concept originated, originating out of Amsterdam, it's always uh, seemed to me a very European kind of feel to it. In terms of uh, content and your coverage, is it, it, it is predominantly European? You, have, uh, you, you also cover the Valley in America as well? Or what, what's the kind of uh, balance on the content? 
Well, we kind of look to our audience in a lot of ways. Uh, um, we're 40% US uh, in terms of audience. Uh, then it's ten um, percent UK. No, I think I think India is is up there as well. It's ten percent UK. And then third is India. So um, uh, and then below that is a lot of uh, European countries. So in terms of outlook, I'd say we're very European because we're based in Europe. Um, quite a lot of our staff are in Europe, but then. Um, 40% of our audience in the States. Uh, so we do look to America a lot. Um, but then I think what, what being based in Europe gives us over a lot of our rivals like TechCrunch or The Verge is that because we're, we're kind of European at heart, we have an international outlook at heart. And that means that rather than thinking of... Um, it's, it's, sometimes it's little things. Like um, we were writing about the um, uh, the new um, Amazon Fire TV a couple of weeks ago, and um, our writer in New York had been to the event and got one to review. She'd taken it home. She'd done a, a write-up about it. It was being proofread. And the guy in London who was proofreading it for her said, well, is this available internationally? And she was like, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that because... I've only ever written for a U.S. audience in my old jobs, and uh, so there's this kind of assumption that you're American with a lot of um, a lot of our rivals, and everywhere else is just international. Uh, whereas we're international, and America is you know an important place, but it's part of a, a wider mix. And so we have contributors uh, covering Eastern Europe, um, Middle East, uh, um, uh, various other places as well. Who kind of uh, Latin America is a big one for us. Um, uh, who uh, give monthly roundups of what's happening there, and can also kind of chip in with uh, news as it comes to them as well. So it, it gives us uh, more of a, a global outlook, which, which we're very proud of. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, I I think it's uh, great for someone to be given such a kind of heavy focus on the European scene, um, rather than always uh, just focusing on the valley. Um, I wonder what your your take is on the whole. You know, we're going to be the next Silicon Valley. X is the next Silicon Valley. Should we just concentrate on being Copenhagen and Oslo and being the best that we can be and be in Europe, or should we be comparing ourselves and aspiring to that? Where do you stand on that that whole uh, debate? I think anyone who thinks that they can be the next Silicon Valley has no idea about what made Silicon Valley Silicon Valley. It's, you know, you're talking about well over 50 years of history of uh, uh, what's happened in the valley and how uh, science and uh, technology has developed in that region over a long time, over generations. And uh, that generational aspect is, is huge in terms of the kind of repeat investments and learning from your peers and being surrounded by uh, innovation from childhood, um, a lot of the people who, who grow up in the valley. So I, I don't think it, it, it's uh, realistic for anyone to say we're going to be the next Silicon Valley. But at the same time, yes, you should absolutely should want to uh, uh, challenge the products coming out of Silicon Valley on your own terms. And um, uh, certainly, uh, I mean, I've never been to Oslo, but I have been to Copenhagen. And I think that Copenhagen is um, incredibly um, undervalued by a lot of uh, the um, investors I speak to, a lot of the people who are going to follow the uh, tech scene. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll talk about um, uh, so, uh, very, you know, the usual cities around Europe, but Copenhagen is never one of those cities. And um, a couple of years, well, it's three years ago, um, uh, Tommy Arles uh, from Podio invited me over, and um, uh, it was partly to see Podio uh, when they were still independent, and it was partly um, he he uh, gave me uh, invitations to uh, go and see lots of other startups. So he arranged appointments uh, for loads of other startups around Copenhagen. So I had this brilliant day where I basically walked around uh, Copenhagen uh, city centre meeting startups, um, and uh, that was that was such a fun day. And uh, uh, going out to the, uh, the 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 boat house where Endemondo is and all that kind of thing. It, it, it just had such a nice vibe that city, and the people had such a nice. Um, uh, attitude and um, uh, such a great approach and there you know as you know there are some great companies that have come out of Copenhagen so um, I think that uh, I think part of it is knowing when to fly the flag for what you're doing because if you look at some cities they fly the flag for what they're doing more than they do things and uh, so there are some places that really hype themselves up as we're the next big city and they really don't have much to show for it. Whereas other, other places quietly get on with things. Uh, in Manchester, uh, where I'm based in the north of England, we have that problem. 
Uh, Manchester is, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, it's steeped in technological history. Uh, a lot of uh, kind of the pioneers of uh, computer science uh, did work in Manchester. And, uh, you know, some of the early computers were built here. And uh, so uh, to... Uh, uh, and we have a great computer science department in uh, in the university. And what we find is a lot of the people there go off to London because uh, they, they can get well-paid jobs there. But they don't realize that there's actually you know, great companies doing brilliant things in Manchester. I mean, hardly anyone knows that um, uh, the the work to uh, move um, Apple over to Intel chips from IBM chips was done in Manchester quietly for two years. This company in the centre of Manchester knew about this massive change Apple was going to make and they just had to quietly get on with it. And so, so you have these massive success stories around the city and uh, yeah, uh, people just quietly get on with it and, and uh, as a result of that you don't get the kind of a te international tension so much and people don't really you know, it, it doesn't create the kind of uh, external attention that can then bring things up to the next level, I think. So uh, uh, if you're being successful, um, uh, then uh, yes, uh, make sure people know about it, basically. Cool. Yeah, that's great. And uh, good to hear some, some kind words about uh, Copenhagen. Um, and it's certainly my opinion that not just in Copenhagen, but the, the whole of the Nordics, there's, there's kind of a, I mean, a history of... Uh, technological innovation and, and really a kind of movement right now as well. Um, so I wonder what your, your take was, not, you know, not just a, maybe as a, the Nordics as a whole in, in terms of what's happening right now or even a, a broader kind of European scale, kind of what you feel the, the current state of, of the, the European ecosystem or Nordic ecosystem is. Uh, yeah, well, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the Nordics, uh, I I, I uh, have to um, kind of hold my head in shame and say I very rarely get out to you know there are some great conferences up there, um, and um, I, I I I I haven't been to any of them recently. Uh, we uh, we had a, a great uh, uh, report from uh, Slush in uh, Finland um, uh, last uh, last autumn. And um, uh, you know, there's, there's some great things going on there. So we try to report on as much as going uh, is going on there as possible. But uh, sometimes uh, it's hard for me to get out there myself. Um, one thing that uh, actually the, the startup that's uh, exciting me most in Europe at the moment on a product level is is from Sweden. It's uh, narrative, and uh, I'm wearing my narrative clip here. Um, uh, it takes a photograph every 30 seconds, and uh, it's a, a great little device. And I love walking around uh, the city with, uh, city with this. Um, I made the stupid mistake of walking through um, immigration in the States last month wearing it, or two months ago wearing it. Um, that wasn't a good idea. I uh, Yeah, I, I got stopped. I got held. Um, they asked me lots of questions about it. Um, and uh, they, they, in the end, they made, they made me delete all the photos that had been taken in, in the airport. I, it was a stupid mistake. I shouldn't have uh, worn it through an airport. Um, I'd just forgotten I was wearing it um, until he said, what's that thing clipped to your uh, shirt there? I was like, no. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, I, uh, so, so yeah, what, what interested me, though, was when I was uh, waiting um, in the airport, waiting to hear whether they were going to arrest me, whether they were going to smash this thing up and never give it back to me, um, uh, which luckily they didn't do, they gave it back to me. But uh, while I was waiting for that, um, one of the security guards at the airport came up to me and was like, oh yeah, I've seen one of those, I follow technology, that, that, that's from Sweden, isn't it? So uh, um, even in uh, Atlanta airport, uh, uh, it, it, the word of uh, um, Nordic innovation had got out, which was uh, uh, great to see. But uh, uh, yeah, um, I think more generally across Europe, at the moment, I mean, it, it, it's a great time. I mean, you, you see across Europe, uh, the attention that's being paid on startups and on innovation, and it's a kind of uh, a lot of that is a reaction to kind of getting out of the economic doldrums. Let's, uh, you know, it, it's a good time to uh, invest in new ideas uh, rather than safe bets, uh, which is good to see. Um, although I, I speak to a lot of startups who are still struggling, who are still uh, finding that um, it's uh, a lot easier for them to move to the States to get investment than it is to stay in Europe. Uh, we have some great early stage investors in uh, Europe um, and uh, you know there's some great infrastructure for uh, late stage companies as well, uh, but sometimes it doesn't all seem to match up. 
and you get uh, companies who uh, kind of uh, flounder by the, the wayside while uh, their US rivals uh, uh, do really well. Um, so there's definitely more to be done. And uh, I mean, I think the good thing is, certainly in uh, a lot of places uh, that I go to, uh, the politicians are paying attention and uh, they seem in a lot of cases to be listening to the right people or certainly uh, from the conversations I have where, uh, you know, people t tell me about uh, what politicians are up to. In a lot of cases, they seem to be listening to the right people, which is good, uh, rather than listening to the first person who comes along with a, a crazy idea and a, a bid for how to spend a million pounds. Um, so that's good. Uh, but yes, uh, still a lot of work to be done in Europe. But, uh, you know, I look back to when I started covering startups in Europe five years ago, and uh, things are, are definitely got a lot better now. Cool. That's uh, promising to hear, especially the, the <laughs> Atlanta story and then uh, being aware <laughs> that it came from Sweden. That's quite surprising, but, but welcome. Yeah. Um, so maybe moving on a little to, to kind of the, your day job. Um, actually, I just, uh, more out of curiosity than anything, I wonder kind of how many pitches you get a day from startups to, to cover in the next web and uh, kind of what is the, the, the range of quality of those? I mean, are they kind of 80% kind of just uh, straight delete because there's, there's no value in it or kind of, you know, how many do you receive and what's the kind of quality of those? Uh, the, I mean, the quality is variable. Variable uh, from a, on an average day. I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, people ask me this a lot, and uh, because I'm kind of just you know going through my inbox so much, it's hard to kind of keep count of how many you get. On a personal level, I'd say it's probably around. Uh, 300, I mean, that, that's probably, you know, on a bad day, 300, you know, when there's a lot. Um, uh, on, a, on a, the next web level, if you look at all the things that come into the tips at the next web email address, which is more, you know, just general uh, pitches that we'll get, um, that can be well over a thousand in a day. And then if you combine that with all the pitches that uh, all the other staff members get, you know, we're probably dealing with 2,000 a day. Um, uh, it's important to note that not all fresh-faced new startups wanting coverage. There's a lot of really terrible apps, a lot of really terrible social media marketing campaigns. Um, so you know, there's a lot of things that aren't necessarily things that we'd cover, uh, but uh, that, that get pitched to us anyway. I keep a, um, a, a Gmail label, uh, really bad press releases. Uh, and uh, what I do with that is uh, sometimes I'm asked to do uh, uh, a, a talk where I talk about uh, tips for pitching to the press. And uh, so uh, I'll go through that um, label. And I'll find you know the worst examples, uh, usually anonymize them a little bit, um, and then stick, the, stick them as a slide in the presentation. Uh, but uh, yeah, you, you get. I mean, to me, the best pitches are literally um, a really quick personal. Uh, kind of thing. They're not too personal, not creepy. You get some who are like, hey, I, I, I saw you, you, hurt, you fell over and, and hurt your leg last week. I hope you're okay now, kind of thing, because they've been reading the Twitter account and they think like, oh, I know, I'll, uh, I'll try and make myself seem like their best friend, um, which, uh, you know, I understand why it's done, but it just comes off as a bit creepy if you don't know the person, um, a bit weird, a bit of a strange way to start the conversation. So the ones that basically go, hi, Martin, um, we're launching a new uh, app next week, which does this, this, and this. Um, it's a bit like Foursquare, but it is 10 times more exciting because of this, this, this reason, or whatever. You know, that kind of thing. Really simple, that uh, doesn't kind of over egg the pudding, doesn't really kind of overhype it, doesn't go into too much detail. Sometimes uh, you'll get like a huge essay um, in a first email and it's really hard not to just delete those um, I personally I'm, I'm one of the people who tries to read every email I get and um, respond to as many as I can um, it's getting really hard to do that these days and so I do find myself at least archiving them which <laughs> is kind of like a, a less guilty version of delete except it means that I'm at 90% on my uh, inbox now so uh, my, my gmail account so I've got to sort that out but um, but still yeah definitely the ones that are short snappy to the point uh, they're the ones that get that get a, a response and uh, are generally the ones that will be mo most interested in covering and uh, be like yes tell us more. Cool. So, 
I guess uh, probably a question that you've also been asked before is what is the worst one you've you've ever received? Without needing to go in the folder, there must be one at the the top of your head that you can just uh, reel off that, that was uh, particularly bad or. Right. Well, the one that springs to mind, um, I mean, there are lots that spring to mind that are just kind of uh, generic ones that have uh, far too many buzzwords in them. Uh, that, that's, a, that's always a red flag. If It's all about kind of game changing, um, all that kind of uh, rubbish. You know, don't say you're game changing. Just tell us what you do and we'll decide if you're game changing. Um, but uh, yeah, lots of ones. that uh, There was one that made up um, a new... Uh, term so you know um, solo mo social local mobile which is a you know was a nice buzzy phrase a few years ago it's incredibly tired now and it's it, you don't put that in your pictures because it, it just makes you look like you're from you hi I come from 2011 but um, uh, somebody had taken that and added another one at the end so it was something like solo mo I can't remember. They'd added something else to the end of it to make it like four things. And it was like, no, don't do that. We've created something new. No, don't do that. Um, but uh, the absolute worst, and this is actually one that we ended up writing up, was um, a, uh, a company that issued a press release uh, saying that the company's CEO had a clout score of 86. Um, this guy had... Uh, a moderately impressive clout score, and um, yes, he um, uh, issued a press release about it. <laughs> and uh, so, in the end, it was, luckily it was a quiet Friday, and we published a post: "Breaking man has clout score of 86." And uh, yeah, I, I think he was probably a bit embarrassed about that, and I think he ended up blaming the PR company, um, who had uh, probably no idea what a clout score was, and thought it was the most impressive thing that he told them in their briefing or something like that. I don't know, but um, uh, it, it was funny at least. But uh, yeah, if you if you're going to issue a press release about something, make sure it's actually something that is interesting, is new, uh, and is unique. Cool. Um, I'm gonna see if anyone has a, a question at this point. But actually, before I do that, I actually wanted to say the, the article you mentioned about Copenhagen. Um, mm. When I moved here, I didn't know anyone in the startup scene. I actually used your article to reach out to the startups in the article to have a coffee with the, the founders. And then they introduced me to people and introduced me to people and introduced me to people. So your article was actually the basis of how I got uh, connected in the ecosystem in Copenhagen. So I guess we kind of come uh, full circle uh, tonight. So that's uh, just a little interesting uh, fact for you. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, but yeah, I'm going to open it. I'll see anyone here have a question. Um, OK, so you're stuck with me still, Martin. <laughs> um, so I guess the, the obvious uh, question to follow on from what we were talking about is uh, you mentioned that the, the best thing to do is just to be very clear. Um, in what you're saying and maybe make a reference to, to something that, that you're comparable to. Um, but is there any other kind of tips to say you receive these 2,000 uh, pitches a day? I mean, there must be something that, that we could do to, to stand out amongst those 2,000. Is there anything that, that puts you, catches the eye immediately? Any kind of uh, tips and tricks you could give around that? It's really difficult to give a, like a golden rule because, I mean, uh, it's so dependent on so many different things. I mean, uh, you know, and this isn't just me. It's, it's every uh, tech journalist is a human. And um, so, you know, they have variable days and different levels of different chemicals in their body. And I'm not talking about artificial chemicals. I'm talking about, you know, the, the chemicals, that, uh, the hormones and everything in your body it change from day to day. So your mood changes from day to day and uh, your, your busyness levels and all of that. So the amount of attention you, can, uh, attention you can pay to email changes. So, so the way you approach your inbox changes from day to day. Uh, but certainly uh, what I find is uh, that um, it's, it just has to be, I mean, sh brevity is the most important thing. A short, concise email that makes me want to know more. Uh, Press releases are fine. Some people really hate press releases. Some people have, uh, uh, in fact, some PR companies uh, I know have actually sworn off press releases. Say we don't do press releases anymore because they're they're boring, uh, which is true. But if you're looking for a concise way to get a lot of information across, uh, a press release can be actually quite useful. And it, it, you know, uh, certainly uh, a lot of tech journalists are kind of. Uh, um, well versed in extracting information from a press release and uh, turning it into something uh, more uh, useful for readers. Uh, but um, certainly uh, feel free to paste in a press release 
Uh, but uh, yes, absolutely. Having a, a short introduction. Um, if you can, no, yeah, one thing definitely not to do is to not link to your company. Uh, some people do that. I don't know how they forget that. They'll have their email address. But having to guess what the URL of your, your website is, is is a bit of an odd one. Um, so definitely have that. Um, increasingly popular uh, uh, are the kind of uh, uh, press release uh, media kit services. So uh, PR.co is one example. Uh, there are others. PR.co only stays in my mind because it's actually created by the Next Web. I'm not. I'm not plugging it. It's just the, the only one I can remember right now. Um, uh, and uh, so, what that does is it allows you to create um, a place where you have all your resources, your know, screenshots, um, your company logo. You have your your press releases, uh, background information about the company, all in one place that the media can really easily get to so that you can literally just say, hi, we're announcing this. Um, it, uh, the, the app will be live tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, here's a link with more information. Um, you might not want to do that straight away. You may want to check the journalist is interested first. But having something like that is, is really useful. Um, uh, some PR companies actually do that uh, for all their... Uh, all their clients now, they'll just have a dedicated web page that they'll send you to that has all the information. Because they, uh, I think they trust that um, they're, they're dealing with journalists who won't go and get, share that link on Twitter and say, hey, look what this company's doing. So, uh, yeah, um, a good thing, though, is to build up a relationship with uh, journalists who show an interest. So if someone's shown an interest, don't wait a year and a half to get back in touch with them again. Drop them a line every you know, six months, uh, whenever you've got something interesting that's going on, even if it's not quite uh, newsworthy, at least just saying hi, just to let you know this is happening. Um, I know you're probably not interested in covering it, but I just thought, you know, I'd, I'd let you know. Uh, it's good. Um, making sure that you uh, say hello at conferences, if you're at the same tech conference or whatever, uh, meet up events, that kind of thing. Uh, Definitely face to face. You know, it's good to then have that kind of connection. When then I get an email from you three months later, um, I do that sometimes. I, uh, I can think of one example where um, the uh, the CMO for a startup came up to me at the uh, Dublin Web Summit. Uh, kind of shook my hand. Didn't want to really uh, pitch the company. Didn't you know want coverage? Just kind of uh, I asked, I asked out of politeness. Oh, what do you do? What's the company do? Uh, she explained. And and that was it. You know, we exchanged cards, and and that was it. Uh, but and then a couple of times on Twitter, she kind of replied to my tweets, and you know, like we have a little brief conversation. And then three months later, she uh, sent me a, a pitch for some news. And because I I recognised the name, and um, I, I obviously could place this person, it put me in a better frame of mind for relating to what uh, she, uh, she was telling me about the company. Uh, even though I still didn't really know that much about the company at the time she pitched me, at least I could relate to what she was doing, and uh, it, it it kind of made me want to pay a bit more attention to it than just something out of the blue. Um, as another example, uh, I don't want to go about this, uh, about this too long, but as an opposite example of this, there was um, a company who obviously hired uh, a PR company to do all of their um, press releases and everything, and the PR company put out these repetitive um, pitches that weren't really about the company. They were kind of like, a, oh, we've got a news angle for you about, uh, you know, that was kind of loosely related to what the startup does and our startup can tell you about um, about this, this newsy topic. And uh, basically, they'd send the same email week after week after week. And then at one point, it would go up to daily and we'd get the same email. And then at one point, they changed the email, and they changed like the, the subject line, and they changed the wording slightly, but it was the same pitch. And then it would carry on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And it got to the point where basically I just deleted them without reading them, and it was just like I, I really, you know, I'm growing to hate this company uh, just because their pitch just comes through the same every time. I shouldn't hate them. I don't really know that much about what they do, but their, their pitch is so bad, and there are so many other pitches we get that, you know, I can't spend that much time uh, on it. And then just a couple of weeks ago, I was at an event in uh, Manchester, my home city. That startup stands up and pitches. Turns out it's a really interesting startup based in Manchester. And I didn't know. And if the founder had just come up to me, like, and asked for, a, you know, a, you know, a year ago, uh, or the PR company even said, like, look, um, there's a journalist in Manchester who might be interested in you, might be a relevant person for you to meet, uh, and arranged a meeting and got, had gone for a coffee with them. Maybe, I don't know, but maybe I'd have written about them six months ago. So just shows how different approaches and kind of getting the right knowledge out there can be useful.
Cool. That, no, that was a really interesting insight. I mean, it's, it's good to hear kind of how the, the, the process works because, I mean, I've also done it myself in the past and just sent an a email to, to Mike Butcher, or, you know, to yourself and say, hey, do you want to cover, you know, I think uh, pretty much everyone has, has done it and made mistakes um, around it. So it's really good to hear, obviously, firsthand about kind of uh, the best way of actually presenting these. Yeah, I mean, it, it's important to know that look is, is a big feature as well. Uh, more than anything, like, uh, it's sad to say that uh, it can literally just be that um, I might get the most amazing pitch, but I'm on the way to, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, South by Southwest or something, where I'm not going to be able to really pay that much attention to email for a week. Or, you know, uh, I'm going to be doing something where, or, you know, just going on holiday or something, um, and I won't have time to deal with it. So maybe I'll forward it to someone else and say, this looks really interesting. But they have a, a thousand of the pitches, and uh, so they don't get round to it, and it just gets missed. And uh, so even with the best pitch, there's still an element of luck there. But, yeah, it's certainly... You know, those things I've been saying definitely increase chances. Cool. I'll uh, give questions another go briefly. Anyone here? Yep. We have one here. You want to come to the front, Carson? Yeah, I can repeat it. Yeah. Uh, so it's a question from uh, Carson in Copenhagen. Um, he wants to know, uh, do you get video pitches? Um, and is the text best uh, attached or in the email itself? Was that correct, Carson? Yep. Um, well, in, in terms of videos, uh, we, we do get um, videos maybe as part of um, a, a pitch. So I mean, I've never really had it where it's just a link to a YouTube uh, thing, and then it's somebody presenting a video saying, hi, we'd like you to cover our startup. I've never had that. I mean, that might be quite interesting, but, uh, uh, but the problem there is obviously time and location. Uh, you know, if I'm in a coffee shop without any headphones, I might not be able to watch your video. So um, obviously that's uh, not always uh, the best approach. But certainly I, I think that having a, a video demo, especially if it's something that's uh, quite hard to explain, is really useful. Uh, so yes, a video can be useful as part of a, a package. Uh, when it comes to kind of uh, text, uh, you know, if it's a press release or something, uh, generally, I think it's better to paste it in. Um, kind of uh, do it, do a brief introduction, uh, leave a little gap, and then paste. You know, if you've got press release or whatever underneath that. Um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people complain. I mean, it doesn't bother me too much, but uh, I know a lot of people complain about. Um, uh, PDFs being attached uh, to press releases. Um, uh, that's one of my butcher complaints about. Uh, I, I saw, I mean, uh, Mike likes to complain about these things anyway, but uh, he was uh, uh, complaining the other day that he, he was on a deadline and someone had sent him a 28 megabyte Dropbox uh, link um, uh, instead of a press release. Uh, so he had to actually go into Dropbox and uh, find this press release and download the press release. Uh, so it's really about just making as little work as possible uh, to reduce the friction so that somebody who has a, a million emails to get through can uh, get through, uh, can kind of get your message as quickly as possible. But yes, video can be useful uh, as a, a supplementary, uh, you know, information. I suppose, yeah. Cool. Yep. Oh, hang on. Sorry. Hang on. I think Sina's coming. Sina, do you have a question now? We have another one here. Question. Here. Okay, I'm just, I'm just wondering when people send something through to you, um, obviously it's not always going to be of interest for you guys, but how often, if they've sent you something through, how often can they send you something without annoying you um, when something new is happening? Is it like every month, every two weeks? How often does that tend to be? Um, I'd say if it's something really genuinely interesting, then, you know, uh, Every two weeks is fine, but most companies don't have something genuinely interesting every two weeks. Uh, you have these companies who are on massive, you know, kind of uh, massive upward ramps of uh, kind of interest and, uh, you know, user acquisition and things where, you know, they're, they're really hot startups uh, where, you know, they may have something new to report every week. But most companies, uh, you know, even, even with a startup, you, you, you'll, you'll have like, you'll launch your product then maybe 
two months later you'll you'll raise some funding and then maybe things go quiet for six months um, uh, while you're just busy you know building your building your audience you know building your business all that kind of thing and if it's just something things like this uh, then like that you know, the day to day oh we we just uh, got a uh, you know we went from 3,000 users to 6,000 users, that's probably not something that we'd cover, so probably not something uh, to kind of get in touch with. Uh, but if, it, if it's a milestone, if it's something you're genuinely really proud of, um, uh, then uh, yeah, I, I'd say once a month would be kind of uh, the minimum. If you're just kind of checking in to say hi, I'd say once a month would be um, you know, no less than, uh, no, more, no more frequent than that. Um, so once a month every two months is probably probably fine. Um, yeah, uh, it would be a bit weird to get an email every week. Cool. We have a question here in Copenhagen. Hi. Um, in which state of your startup do you think that you should go to the press? Like some people go to the press too early in their state, right? Yeah, well, it, it depends who you're going to. If you're going to kind of uh, a startup-focused tech blog uh, like The Next Web or TechCrunch or whoever, then uh, when you've got um, uh, basically an MVP, um, when you've got something that you can go to your audience with that uh, is good enough to kind of uh, launch with and you're, you're looking to gain more users or you're looking to gain funding, um, then that's a good time to go to the, the press. If you're still at kind of a really early prototype stage where uh, we, get, we get a lot of pitches where it's people saying, we're not launching for three months, but um, we'd like to get people excited about what we're doing, so we'd like to tell you about what we're doing. And the thing is, even if it's really, really interesting, a lot of the time we'll say no because, you know, our, uh, our let's, let's face it, our readers might read that and go, like, oh, that's really interesting, but it's months and months and months away. So it, it's not something that they can try right away. And so it, it, they'll kind of go away with a, a bad feeling about that article, really. It's like, oh, that was cool. Oh, I, I, can't, I can't, uh, can't do anything with it. And also, we don't know if you'll actually deliver on that. You know, it, it's like the crowdfunding thing. Uh, we have so many crowdfunding pitches at the moment, and uh, we've really kind of cut down on the number that we cover because especially when it comes to apps, uh, anyone can mock up some screenshots of what they want an app to look like and have no skill other than having an idea and being able to use Photoshop to mock, mock up some uh, stills and uh, then go to Kickstarter for it. Um, so we try to really focus on the ones that um, uh, are definitely going to become something. I mean, one example where we've covered something before it's launched or before anyone had anything to try uh, was the narrative clip, actually, uh, back when it was the Momoto. Um, I think we first covered that kind of late 2012 something like that, um, just because it was a really interesting idea. Uh, it, you know, they had the prototype, they had, um, uh, you know, uh, they had funding from, you know, uh, well-known investors. So you know, there, was, there was proof there that there was something happening. Um, if you're kind of an unknown team, I'd wait until there's something that can definitely be tried by the audience. Because um, then you know, it works better for you, because then you get, uh, hopefully, uh, as soon as the article goes live, over that day, you'll get lots and lots of people trying your app or your service or, or whatever it is. So yeah, uh, wait until you've got a product. Uh, I'll repeat the question. It's from Carson here. Um, how much time on average do you spend on each article? I guess that includes the, the full cycle of, yeah, including research and, and writing it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends really. Uh, if it's because uh, it really depends on what what it is. Uh, the way we've gone with our coverage recently and our, our content is uh, we're trying to get a better mix of news uh, and kind of uh, features and not so newsy kind of pieces that are kind of resources or guides. Uh, a lot of those are kind of entrepreneur focused. Um, uh, so. It, it varies. Uh, so we can uh, something we're doing more of now is literally these really short posts where, let's say, uh, we've written about you before, but you've got a new update to your app. Um, it's, it's it's quite interesting, but it doesn't warrant 300 words. So we might do basically a hundred words saying this app we've written about here before. Um, it has got this cool new feature. Uh, try it out. Um, and so that may take us um, literally, you know. 25 minutes to do, including adding images and editing and all of that. Um, uh, uh, but then, on the other hand, you've got something like, I mean, let's see, uh, there was um, the Gramophone uh, from Fon, 
which uh, launched uh, yesterday. Um, that actually was a Kickstarter product, but uh, it's it's from a company that's already well known. So uh, and it was a you know a well thought through product, and they've obviously got a product. They're just using that to, using Kickstarter to get ideas for it and uh, to to prove a market for it. Um, so we did a piece about that. Um, that took a lot longer because uh, with that. Um, I think I got an email from the CEO, and then there were multiple emails over a day where I was finding out more information about it. And then the next week, I had a Skype call with the CEO uh, for maybe 20 minutes uh, where we were talking about the product. Um, and then I edited that, uh, that uh, interview, that Skype interview, into a video which uh, I uploaded to YouTube. So that maybe took you know another half an hour to an hour. Um, and then obviously I had to write the article, which uh, you know, about 350 words. It might have taken 45 minutes. Uh, so you know that that maybe took you know two or three hours in total to do. Uh, so yes, it it really varies. And then I'd say most would be uh, more like if you if you're talking to a startup over email. I mean, it, it can be hard to work out exactly how long you spent on one. But uh, uh, one to two hours would seem fair for. Uh, a, a kind of maybe up to 500 word piece. If you're going longer than that, it, you know, we can spend, you know, uh, uh, some of our pieces, you know, a, a writer might spend a day, two days on if it's, if it's a really chunky piece. Cool. Any questions for you for City? Not here. Um, I actually have uh, one um, more to do with, actually, you mentioned Mike and you mentioned TechCrunch. Um, I wondered kind of, is it a friendly rivalry between you and TechCrunch, or kind of what what is the relationship? Do you want to beat them to stories, or you know, you're happy to to be breaking the story at the same time? You know, what what's the the general kind of day to day uh, relationship with you guys, and do you see them as the the competitor, or you know, do you want to be above them, or do you care? I just wondered what your whole take on that was. Well, I think I think um, there's definitely um, competition between. Uh, uh, between uh, different uh, tech blogs uh, for for stories, absolutely. Um, uh, sometimes it can get very petty, and I, I'm, I'm certainly not naming any publication here. It, it happens across all publications. Let's say somebody breaks an embargo. If you follow a few tech journalists on Twitter and somebody breaks an embargo, oh wow! I mean, seriously, like uh, the the fury that can be let loose uh, then uh, it's crazy. And you know, it really, it doesn't matter that much. Uh, it, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you could get stressed about somebody publishing a story slightly earlier than they said they were going to uh, is is not that big a deal. But uh, we're we're dealing with a world where. Um, it's all about who gets the message out on Twitter first. Tends to be the one that uh, people uh, pay pay attention to a lot of the time. You know, um, uh, we found that uh, if if your if your tweet goes out before someone else uh, about the same story, then uh, that becomes uh, uh, that becomes kind of more people will come to you and share your story because they saw it there first. Uh, so there's definitely a kind of a competition when it comes to uh, being fast to stories, but at the same time, I think we all know that that's not necessarily a good, healthy way to live. It's not good for your blood pressure. <laughs> it is not really good for the readers if uh, all you're caring about is being first to a story and not being, uh, not being high quality in, in your approach. Uh, so I, I've seen the tech world, the tech blog, blogging world, become a bit more relaxed about that of late. Uh, the, there was a time when it was, it was, it was crazy and you'd have some people uh, kind of uh, uh, setting their, their, um, their, their posts to go, you know, it was an embargoed post, kind of setting it to go a few seconds earlier than everyone else and things like that because they wanted to go earlier and that kind of thing. Um, so it's a friendly rivalry, I'd say, in general. I mean, I can go out for a drink with, you know, Mike or, you know, uh, any of the guys from TechCrunch or, you know, uh, any of the other tech blogs, and you know, have a, have a good time, and you know, um, you know, we'll, we won't be kind of uh, getting knives out behind each other's backs or anything. But then, when a, an entrepreneur comes along uh, to the bar with a really interesting story, we'll be both fighting to take them off into a corner and find out more um, without the other one hearing. So, uh, yeah, um, on a personal level, absolutely, you know, get, get on with them really well. But uh, certainly, when it comes to uh, um, uh, Breaking stories. Uh, there's definitely a fierce rivalry. Um, I did a um, uh, a panel at South by Southwest 
um, last month uh, with um, Alexia uh, from TechCrunch, um, Cara Swisher from Recode, uh, and um, uh, Jemima Kish from The Guardian. Um, it was about why did the tech journalists well, break the prison story, and, and, and uh, uh, the general sense that the US was uh, 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 you know, and we really should be able to buy a time on and for the Indians, although so, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily bring it as much as you were able to bring it. So, in terms of the biggest note of revelation, we're very uh, European, it's still the biggest in Europe, uh, uh, quite a lot of discussion about the weather is that neutrality, uh, whether it's you know, uh, uh, the government's uh, uh, so uh, on the uh, uh, internet's uh, traffic, uh, all those kinds of issues are in place in Europe because it's over on the right wall of my we're just talking about is that this because company, we're, we're kind of this company at just heart, launched we have an international thing that's out. Uh, you know, those stories may be more clicks, rather than uh, thinking but of, you kind of get um, it's, 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 it's uh, a little thing. Like, like, uh, like, we were the tech world around the big issue. So we all agreed that that was a, that was a problem. And uh, so I suppose uh, acceptance is the, uh, the first uh, stage of solving um, a, a bad problem in your life. So we'll get there. <laughs> cool. So do clicks matter, truthfully? Well, clicks do matter because uh, uh, clicks uh, pay for advertisers. Well, clicks lead to pay payments from advertisers. So uh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, page views are uh, obviously uh, an important thing. Uh, but striking the balance between um, getting readers to read something interesting and well researched and uh, useful, uh, and uh, it, it's kind of the uh, steak versus hamburger approach uh you know you thought uh, do you just want to give uh, your audience hamburgers all the time or do you want to you know uh cook up a nice steak that takes a bit longer and uh, um uh, gives them something more to more to chew on and a bit more nourishment um so uh, yeah uh, obviously there is always like a publisher's dilemma there you know do we publish this uh, story with um, it, you know, with slightly, you know, without spending so much time on it, just so we get something out there, or do we uh, give it, put a bit more effort into it, even though that might mean uh, fewer clicks because we don't, maybe it, it's maybe less sensational under the surface. Um, so it, it's all about trust, really. It's about making sure our readers trust us, but at the same time, making sure our audience is as big as possible. Um, things like social media help with that because uh, obviously knowing how to use social media well uh, can uh, increase your, uh, uh, your traffic without having to resort to the kind of uh, you know, ridiculous um, link bait, click bait headlines. Um, uh, you'll never guess what happened next kind of thing, uh, which we kind of, uh, the only time we've ever done one of those headlines is when we were writing about Upworthy, so I think, uh, uh, which is the blog that uh, does that kind of headline, uh, has made it stuck in trade, so I think we, we, we got away with that one because we were writing about them, but uh, otherwise, yes, um, quality over quantity, definitely, um, and it's interesting to see that um, as well as page views, another metric that's being uh, increasingly taken into consideration is uh, attention, uh, so if you look at something like charts beat, um, I'm just looking at our chart beat console now. Um, that shows me how long, on average, people are spending on individual articles. Um, so I can see, if I look at engaged time, I can say I can see that um, 50 New York City startups you need to know about. That's quite an old article, but at the moment, uh, the, uh, the average engagement time on that is two minutes twenty seconds. Um, so you know that's that's a, a long time, and uh, I think we'll see that being used increasingly as a kind of metric. Um, uh, and at the moment, the the average engagement time across the whole of uh, the next web is forty nine seconds. So on average, at this moment in time, uh, people are spending forty nine seconds um, browsing the next web, whether it's reading one article or uh, browsing a few. Uh, apparently, the the average is thirty seconds. So we're above uh, you know across the web. Um, uh, for chart beat customers, so I think that that's actually really good that we're at, we're at 48, 49 at the moment. Um, but uh, we're we're working on increasing that because if you hang around on the site more, you'll hopefully view more pages. You'll you'll want to come back because you'll see more on the site. Um, and I suspect we'll see attention as a metric become more interesting to advertisers over time as well. But uh, we'll have to see if that happens. The next web in five years, how would that look like? Oh. Oh, well, that's an interesting one. Um, 
Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, uh, the uh, when I joined, the plan was to become. Uh, it was originally to become bigger than CNET, I think, at the time, um, and then it became to become bigger than CNN. Um, I think right now, uh, I think the focus for us is uh, being um, being successful. I mean, we, I don't, I don't think uh, being successful, being you know, uh, being profitable and being um, you know a well-respected uh, company that is 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 doing well. I, I don't think you necessarily have to aim to be toppling media giants to do that. Um, at the moment, we're focusing on uh, growing our events, growing our um, our our publishing side of things. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, that's an interesting point. And I'll have to think of a better answer than I'm not sure in the future. But uh, certainly, um, in terms of where I'd like to see it, I'd like to see it um, uh, 10 times more influential um, and uh, really kind of um, a staple read for everybody in the uh, technology world. Uh, you know, we're we're moving in that direction, but uh, I want I want everyone who's involved in technology around the world to know about the next web and to read it. Cool, that's great. I think uh, we're just about coming up to an hour of your time, Martin. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. Um, we did uh, miss a few people from the sun, so I hope it was still uh, worth your while. It was uh, certainly some great insights that you gave us. Um, so it's certainly uh, great for, for us to hear that. Um, and uh, you'll probably get a lot of people putting that into practice in the audience, and now you're going to get a load of pitches coming from uh, Copenhagen and Oslo uh, in the next uh, couple of hours or days. Um, yeah, no worries. Yeah, yeah. Dr drop me an email anytime, yeah. anyone. Um, uh, Martin at the next web dot com. Uh, happy to hear from you. And uh, yes, it was the uh, the first beautiful sunny day in Manchester uh, this year uh, uh, today as well. So uh, uh, I'll go and get, get grab some last yeah. few minutes of sunshine before the sun goes down. I think. Yeah. Well, thank you for staying in and joining us as well, though. No worries. Cool. Thank Thanks you, a lot. Cheers. Thank you. Goodbye.